Chapter 13 A More Excellent Way 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1 Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass, or a tinkling cymbal. The tongues of men and of angels, the tongues of men are languages spoken by other men. Paul could speak both Greek and Hebrew. Of angels, the tongues of angels are a reference to the supernatural gift of tongues that required an interpreter who had the gift of interpreting tongues. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. Charity, the word charity is translated from the Greek word agape, often translated as love. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1. Charity is found in the middle of three chapters on spiritual gifts that were in operation in the Acts period before the Word of God was completed. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2 And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. The gift of prophecy, a supernatural gift given to a person for a short period of time. 1 Timothy 4 verse 14 Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. And understand all mysteries, this is speaking about the mysteries revealed to the Apostle Paul by the resurrected Christ. Romans 16 verses 25 to 26 Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Ephesians 3 verses 8 to 9 unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, and all knowledge, the manifold wisdom of God concerning his plan for this dispensation of grace. Ephesians 3 verses 8 to 10. I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains. Paul never removed any literal mountains, nor did anyone. Matthew 17 verse 20. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3 And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. People have and will continue to feed the hungry because of their emotions, but a true heart filled with love will give them the gospel as well, and that will last for eternity. I give my body to be burned. Rome would burn bodies on crosses to show its citizens what would happen to them if they defied Roman. Paul gave himself to a cause that could have ended with him being burned alive for his preaching. This practice continued on for hundreds and hundreds of years. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 7 Charity suffereth long and is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. True charity comes from the heart of God, for God is love personified. If we are having a troubled relationship with someone, we can fix it by exhibiting charity in our life towards these people and allow God to deal with their heart. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8 Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, whether there be tongues, they shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Charity passes from one dispensation to another, it never fails or ceases to exist, because God is love. Prophecies, they shall fail, the gift of prophecies, God's word says will fail, cease to happen, in this new dispensation of grace when that which is perfect is come. Verse 10 below. The gift of prophecy was given to some in the early stage of the church's development while the Apostle Paul was filling full, fulfill, the word of God concerning the dispensation given unto him. Colossians 1 verse 25 Whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. Tongues, they shall cease. 
tongues are said to cease in and of themselves without the requirement of that which is perfect coming according to verses 9 and 10. The Corinthian church had its start in a synagogue and later in the house attached to the synagogue as Paul went to the Jew first at that time. The gift of tongues were for a sign to unbelieving Jews. The Jews required a sign. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22 for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Knowledge, it shall vanish away. This is referring to the supernatural sign gift of knowledge vanishing once it is no longer needed when everything God wanted written down was completed. Verse 10 below. In part. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 9 to 10 for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. We know in part, the word of knowledge was a temporary sign gift for the body of Christ in its infancy stage while the word of God was incomplete. When the rest of God's revelations for the dispensation of grace were given to Paul to fulfill, complete, the word of God then the supernatural sign gifts would vanish. Colossians 1 verse 25 whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. We do not know in part anymore, nor do we prophesy in part anymore because that which is perfect, complete, is come in God's revelations to the body of Christ in Romans through Philemon. We prophesy in part, when 1 Corinthians was written the body of Christ did not have a complete set of instructions about how they were to conduct themselves as believers in this new dispensation. Israel as a whole has been blinded in part and they will remain that way until after the rapture ends this dispensation, when God's focus will once again return to the nation of Israel. Romans 11 verse 25 For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That which is perfect is come, that which is complete. The completed revelation of the mystery, God's word for us today. Then that which is in part shall be done away, that which is only partial at the time. The sign gifts in verse 9. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 11 When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. When I became a man, I put away childish things, we today have that which is perfect, the epistles of Romans Philemon, so we no longer require the childish sign gifts. We have moved into spiritual maturity. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now we see through a glass darkly. At the time of Paul's writing of 1 Corinthians, he had not as of yet received all the revelations that God was going to give to him, and so the sign gifts were initially necessary. But then face to face, we can now see clearly exactly what God wants for us in the body of Christ today because God's revelation to us is perfect, complete. Colossians 1 verse 25 whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. Many epistles would not be given to Paul for us for another 20 years until after Paul was arrested the final time where he spent some of his last years writing Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Upon his brief release before his death, he penned the pastoral epistles of 1 Timothy and Titus, and when re-imprisoned he wrote 2 Timothy. These all teach the body of Christ how we are to behave ourselves in the church of God, and how the man of God is to do the work of the ministry in the church, which is Christ's body. Paul was told by God that he would receive latter revelations, and he was waiting for them himself, so that he too would no longer know only in part. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 1 and 7 Notice in verse 12 that Paul was sure that he would know God's word completely when that which is perfect was come. He was anticipating God's further revelation to him, and he did receive it, and he was faithful to give it out to us. We don't have to be confused because we only see through a glass darkly because God's word is complete for us today, and we can see as it were face to face. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 13 And now Abadeth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. 
Paul concludes this great chapter with its original subject of charity, the key to helping others receive the truth. Chapter 14 An Unknown Tongue 1 Corinthians 14 verses 1 to 2 follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Prophesy, speaking to the church things that edify, exhort, and comfort. Verse 3. An unknown tongue. The word unknown is mentioned six times in this chapter, and it is always paired with the word tongue. When someone in Paul's day spoke in an unknown tongue, Paul said they were speaking mysteries to the rest of the church because what he was saying was unknown to them, there needed to be an interpreter. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 3 to 5, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. In verse 3 we see someone prophesying and people being edified by it because they could understand it. Notice how in verse 4 the word unknown is mentioned in italics which means it isn't in the original Greek, but it is put there for our admonition to help us understand the context of the passage. The language was unknown by the speaker. An interpreter was often necessary for the others in the crowd who did not speak the same language as the speaker at that moment. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. It is better for the church to be edified by a message they can understand than an alleged message that they cannot. Except he interpret, without interpretation no one would be edified by the message in the church. Paul forbade speaking in tongues without an interpreter. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 6 Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine? By revelation, when Paul received a revelation from Christ, he shared it with the church in their own language. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 1 to 7 It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth winky face such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body, or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth winky face. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to befame me, lest I should be exalted above measure. If someone received a word of knowledge in those days, they were to share it in their native tongue so that all could be blessed. The same was true for prophesying and sharing doctrine with the church. It would make no sense to receive a message from God and then speak that message in tongues and then the same person interprets it for them. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 7 to 9 And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise, ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. An uncertain sound, speaking into the air was when people gave messages in tongues without an interpreter that could not be understood by the hearers. Then the hearer had to trust the message giver's interpretation. God did not put all the gifts in one person in the church so they could be the final authority in everything. 
These sign gifts are not in operation today, nor has they been since the word of God was completed after Paul's epistles were written. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 10 to 14 There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so ye, forasmuch as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Pray that he may interpret. The word unknown means that language is unknown to the speaker. This does not mean it is an unknowable language. Someone who had the gift of interpretation of tongues could come alongside and edify the church by interpreting the tongue spoken. Why would God do this in this fashion and not just give the person a revelation in a tongue all could hear and understand? Because the Jew required a sign that God was speaking to them, these are called sign gifts. This was important for a church which began in a Jewish synagogue in Corinth. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 1 to 7 It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth winky face such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body, or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth winky face. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. This speaking in an unknown tongue differed from what occurred on Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost those that heard them speak recognized their native languages, tongues. Acts 2 verses 4 to 11 And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians, and Medes, and Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. Praying, singing, and blessing with the Spirit were all gifts in the early church only. These gifts ceased. When that which is perfect was come, the completed word of God. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 10 But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. God put away the childish things of miraculous signs when the church had the word of God completely revealed to them. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 15 to 16 What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say Amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? When we pray, or sing, or whatever we do in the church, it should all be done to edify the hearers. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 17 to 19 For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all, 
Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. I speak with tongues more than ye all. Paul spoke with tongues more than anyone, not because he was spiritually more important. When Paul spoke to churches, he would have had someone who could interpret any unknown tongue that was given to him. We do not have any message that Paul spoke to any congregation that the writer tells us that he received that message by an unknown tongue and then it was interpreted. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 20 to 21 Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 28 verses 11 to 12 For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Be not children in understanding, spiritual babies. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 22 Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Tongues are for a sign. It makes perfect sense here that God uses other languages as a sign to the unbelieving Jews first, and then the Gentiles as well, to help them understand the gospel in their own language. The Jews in those days got a double dose of conviction, first from the gospel message itself, and secondly from an added conviction found in Isaiah 28 verses 11 to 12, which is quoted back in verse 21 of this chapter. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 23 If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned, or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? because even a lost person knows there is no need for these gifts in this situation. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 24 to 26 But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so, falling down on his face he will worship God, and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren? When ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. This is what goes on in carnal churches today just like it was in Corinth in Paul's day. This book was a condemnation and a correction of a very messed up church. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 27 to 28 If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Tongues were not allowed to be spoken in the church without an interpreter. Period. The same would apply today if tongues were for today, but they are not. They were gifts for the church in its infancy, but when the church matured those childish gifts vanished as is testified by the 1,900 years of silence in those areas. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 29 to 31 Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. Ye may all prophesy one by one, all three could take their turn giving their prophecy, while the others would judge what the prophet was saying whether it was from God or not. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 32 to 33 And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let the prophets speak two or three, God is the God of order, but the Corinthian church had become totally out of order with different schisms in that body and each competing with the other for preeminence. Let the other judge, a prophet who could discern spirits in those days would judge whether the message was from God or from a seducing spirit. These sign gifts are not still in operation today. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Remember the gift of discerning of spirits. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 34 to 35 Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, 
but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Let the women keep silence in the churches. What is the context of these three chapters? Gifts and their operation in the church. Men have the role as the spiritual leader in the churches. Women are not to be teaching men in the church. Deborah criticized the men of Israel and told them that a woman would get the credit for doing what was supposed to be a man's job to do and that that would bring shame to their nation. Judges 4-5 1 Corinthians 14 verses 36 to 40 what? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. The things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. God says through the Apostle Paul that if they want to remain ignorant on this subject, let them. Did you see what Paul called these teachings? The commandments of the Lord. Covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. When those gifts were in operation before the word of God was complete, the people were to allow the gifts to operate as intended. Once that which is perfect has come, these gifts were no longer needed. Any alleged manifestations of these gifts being claimed today are from seducing spirits, they are not from God today. Chapter 15 The Gospel 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 3 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, Paul here declares once again the gospel to the Corinthians as he did when he was with them originally, and they received it and stood for it. Acts 18 By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, not all that heard stood with the message, because they either did not believe everything concerning Christ's death for them, which caused their belief to be in vain. Notice that Paul says that he delivered the gospel that he received, while the twelve delivered the gospel which they had heard from Christ, there is a difference. Paul says that Christ died for us according to the scriptures, so his death is not a mystery because it is recorded throughout the pages of prophecy, which makes it a part of Israel's prophecy program. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, Isaiah 53 verses 1 to 11 who hath believed our report. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, 
for he shall bear their iniquities. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4 and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, there are three parts to the gospel found in this chapter, Christ's death, burial, and his resurrection. Daniel in chapter 9 speaks of the Messiah being cut off, killed. Psalm 16 verse 10 tells us about his burial. Peter addressed Jews from all over the world on the day of Pentecost, and he quotes a passage from King David found in the Psalms. Psalm 16 verse 10, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So even the resurrection of the dead was a part of Israel's prophecy program because we find it mentioned in prophecy. If Christ's resurrection were something new it would not be found in the pages of prophecy, but it would have been hidden God from before the foundation of the world and would have been revealed by the Apostle Paul. Paul here is relaying a fact that could be known from reading Israel's prophecy program. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, Psalm 16 verse 10, and the story of Jonah. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 5 and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Notice that the gospel doesn't stop with the fact that he rose again the third day, but it goes on to add that he was seen alive afterwards. What good would a risen Christ be if no one ever saw the risen Christ? They would have gone their ways and Christianity would have died without his appearing unto his saints. He was seen of Cephas, Christ, it says, appeared unto many, and here it records his appearance unto Cephas, Simon Peter, after his resurrection which is found in the Gospel of Luke, and then he appears later unto the twelve, Luke 24 verse 34 saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. Then of the twelve, Judas was dead, so the only person that Paul could be referring to was Matthias. Matthias saw the risen Christ on a couple of occasions. See Acts 1 verse 26 where Luke declares Matthias as being numbered with the eleven. Acts 1 verse 26 And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 6 After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once. He appeared only to believers because faith cometh by hearing, not sight. They had the word of God in their hands, and they also had the word of God in their midst. Jesus is the word of God. John 1 verse 1 They should have recognized him by checking out his words and deeds and compared them with what the scriptures said the Messiah would do, but they did not. Besides, Jesus himself said that that people would not believe even if someone rose from the dead as he told the story of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 7 to 8 After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. After that, he was seen of James, his half-brother, who became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. Then of all the apostles, all twelve of them. And last of all he was seen of me also, this occurred in Acts 9, on the road to Damascus. As one born out of due time, the only thing this could mean in the physical realm was that he was actually born late, not early, but Paul has a spiritual meaning in mind here. The due time for Israel to be saved was when the Messiah came, and Paul didn't get saved until after the due time for Israel. Israel will however be born again in one day at the onset of the kingdom when they recognize their true Messiah. Psalm 53 verse 6 O oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. When God bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. Isaiah 2 verse 3 And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Romans 11 verse 26 And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Shaun the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9 For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. 
I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle. He deemed himself not fit to be called an apostle because he was the chief lead sinner against the church of God. 1 Timothy 1 verses 15 to 16 This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all longsuffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10 But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. By the grace of God, I am what I am, an apostle of the Gentiles. Romans 11 verse 13 His grace which was bestowed upon me, Romans 12 verse 3 For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Romans 15 verse 15 Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind, because of the grace that is given to me of God, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10 According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 1 We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Galatians 2 verse 9 And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 11 Therefore whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Verse 9 also goes with verse 8 and helps us understand the context and meaning of Paul's comment. He says he doesn't deserve to be called an apostle because he persecuted the kingdom church that the apostles were building, but by grace Jesus saved the chief of sinners out of due time. Paul would have rather been saved in due time so that all the memories of his torturing and killing of those early believers would not be a part of his past, but he couldn't change the past, and neither can we. We are what we are as Paul is what he is. Has the grace that has been bestowed upon you been in vain? Paul's grace wasn't. He got busy serving the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 12 to 13 Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Some among you, some Corinthians had a hard time with the idea of a resurrection of the body, while others were willing to accept that Christ arose bodily, and still others only believed he rose spiritually. Resurrection of the dead, there is a resurrection of the just, and the unjust in the Bible. Acts 24 verse 15 And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. 2 Peter 2 verse 9 The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. The just are resurrected to eternal life, while the unjust are resurrected to be judged and cast into the lake of fire for eternity. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 14 to 16 And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yeah, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. Your faith is also vain. This is what Paul meant about some having believed in vain at the beginning of this chapter. It is an empty faith if one does not believe in an empty tomb. Christ is risen, and because he is risen as the first fruits, so we also will arise from the dead. If there is no resurrection of Christ, then there is no forgiveness of sins because the wages of sin is death, and he paid our wages for us to take away our sin. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 18 to 20 Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, 
we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. They which are fallen asleep in Christ, those who had believed in Christ and who had died would be in torment still unto this day if the resurrection were not true. The first fruits of them that slept, it says in verse 20 that Christ rose from the dead, which means the others remained asleep or among the dead. Sleep is often used as a synonym for death in the scriptures. Deuteronomy 31 verse 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up, and go a-whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me, and break my covenant which I have made with them. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 21 to 23, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. By man came death, by Adam sin death came upon all men as we are all now born sinners. By man came also the resurrection, the good news however is that Christ died for all mankind to make us alive one day if we are in Christ. It is available to all who will call upon him, but unfortunately all do not. Jesus Christ is the second Adam, the God-man, that could reverse what the first Adam messed up. In Adam, sin is passed down to each human being by our forefather. In Christ, we are all in Adam, but only those who believe the gospel are in Christ when they die. The Bible records that the graves were opened after Christ's resurrection and many bodies of the Old Testament saints that slept arose and appeared unto many in Jerusalem in Matthew 27 verses 52 to 53. This does not fulfill what Paul is talking about here in verse 23 because he qualifies that group as those that are Christ's that is coming. He hasn't come yet, so their bodies are not raised yet. What happened to the bodies of those Old Testament saints? Did all of the Old Testament saints rise because Christ was fulfilling a type of the first fruit offering on the same day the priests were waving the first fruit offering unto God? Not all the saints arose on that day, only many saints around Jerusalem arose on that day. These bodies then came to Jerusalem and appeared to many in Jerusalem, not all. So, the number was obviously small just like the wave offering was a small example of the amount fruit that was to soon be harvested. If we die before the rapture, then the bodies of those who are dead in Christ will rise first and then those that are alive at his coming will immediately follow and we shall all be changed. The dead, those that sleep, get a head start. Every man in his own order, God is a God of order, and this statement has led some to conclude that Paul refers to both comings of Christ instead of just his coming in the clouds at the rapture. Christ the firstfruits, this is the first order, it happened 2,000 years ago. They that are Christ's at his coming, this will happen at the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 17, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so, shall we ever be with the Lord. The order is easy to understand as we in the body of Christ are made alive and go up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and then the world goes through the time of Jacob's trouble. After its completion believing Israel is resurrected in a one day when Christ appears and sets up his earthly kingdom. Isaiah 66 verse 8 Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 24 to 26 Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign, 
till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Then cometh the end, Christ must rule for a thousand years before he delivers up the kingdom to God the Father. Death will still exist throughout Christ's kingdom, but it will not reign anymore. He must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Psalm 110 verse 1. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death not a created being as Satan is, but it is a consequence for our sin. When a person dies at an hundred years of age for having rejected Christ's authority in the millennial kingdom, he will be thought of as a mere child. Death will also have an end at the end of the kingdom after Satan has been cast into the lake of fire with those who have been raised to stand at the great white throne judgment and been found unworthy. Revelation 20 verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 27 to 28, For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith, all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, Christ shall have his day very soon, and then he shall place himself back under subjection to his Father as in the past. That God may be all in all, for four thousand years God the Father had the preeminence, then for three years the Son of God was recognized by only a handful as the Christ, but he never reigned. Then for the last two thousand years the Holy Spirit has lived inside all those who have believed the gospel of the grace of God, while Christ sat on the right hand of the Father in heaven. When Christ returns, he will finally reign for a thousand years before subjecting himself under God the Father that God may be all in eternity future. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 29 to 32 else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage at me, if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Baptized for the dead, no scripture is of any private interpretation, which simply means you cannot take an obscure passage of scripture like this one and build a doctrine from it. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, to establish any doctrine. Isaiah 28 verse 10 and 13. An explanation is found when we relate it to the subject of baptism and resurrection, however. Who are baptized today? People who have died unto Christ. Romans 6 verses 1 to 11. These are not corpses in a graveyard, but people who have died to themselves. Paul said that he dies daily. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but we are made alive in Christ. Those of us who were baptized into Christ, not with water, are baptized into his death. Romans 6 is referring to spirit baptism, not water, just as verse 29 refers to spirit baptism. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. This is a reference to the uproar started by Demetrius the silversmith who gathered all of his workmen of like occupation and rioted against Paul. Acts 19, 23-20, What advantage at me, if the dead rise not, why should Paul have risked his life preaching to others if there was no resurrection and afterlife? He shouldn't have if it were not true, but since it is, it was something he was willing to die for so that others may rescued from the darkness of Satan. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 33 to 34 Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness, and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God, I speak this to your shame. Awake to righteousness, and sin not, wake up to who you are in Christ, someone who is dead to sin, and live righteously because of that. Romans 6 verses 1 to 11. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 35 to 38. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? 
Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain, it may chance of wheat, or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Quickened, to be made alive. Paul, as he often does, uses a farming illustration to prove his point. Paul relates our bodies to a seed which has been sowed in the earth. The seed must first die before it can be made alive again with the water, soil nutrients, and the sunlight, just as we must die to put off our corruptible bodies and bring forth an incorruptible body that will be immortal in the heavens. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 39 to 41 All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies, and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. Celestial bodies, heavenly bodies, bodies terrestrial, earthly bodies. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 42 to 44 So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown in natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. It is sown in corruption, the resurrection of the dead will happen once a corruptible body of a believer has died because of sin and has been buried. It is raised in incorruption, then after its physical death it will put on incorruption at the rapture because the person who had inhabited that body had placed their trust in the faith of Christ while they were alive. It is sown in dishonor, we all die because of the curse of sin. It is raised in glory, we, believers, will all live because of Christ. It is sown in weakness, our bodies are deteriorating because of sin. It is raised in power, our bodies are raised by Jesus Christ who is eternal life. It is sown in natural body, dust goes back to dust. It is raised a spiritual body, this mortal puts on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45 And so it is written, The first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Genesis 2 verse 7 And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The first man Adam was made a living soul when God breathed into him the breath of life. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. This is speaking of the Lord from heaven, Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 14 Nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 46 to 48 Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. The Lord from heaven is speaking about Christ the last Adam. Adam was made a living soul when God breathed into Adam the breath of life. The first man is dirt, while the second man is the Lord. Christ on the other hand was made a quickening spirit. Adam was the natural man and Christ is the spiritual man that can make alive all who are in him by faith. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 49 to 50 And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. We have borne the image of the earthy, we already bear the image of our earthly father Adam. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly, we shall soon bear the image of the second Adam, which is Christ, which is far better. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, the earthy image of our sinful ancestor Adam, which we now bear, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, so it must have a new image after Christ. 
It's the sin, corruption, which brought death to us that must be done away with and incorruption must be inherited through the death of the second Adam on our behalf. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 to 52 Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Behold, I show you a mystery. Paul shows the body of Christ here the mystery of the rapture of the church. The rapture is the last event of the mystery program that was revealed solely to the apostle of the Gentiles. Romans 11 verse 13 For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. The last trump, the last trump is not a trumpet, but a trump. This is not a person, nor an archangel, but it is the noise that is made by the trumpet. It is the trump of God, not the trumpets of the seven angels found in the book of the Revelation. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The very next thing that happens is the prophecy program starts back up with Israel once again as the main character, and the time of Jacob's trouble begins, otherwise known as the tribulation period. Jeremiah 30 verse 7 Alas! For that day is great, so that none is like it, it is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 53 to 55 For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought. To pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Isaiah 25 verse 8 He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. Hosea 13 verse 14 I will ransom them from the power of the grave, I will redeem them from death, O death, I will be thy plagues, O grave, I will be thy destruction, repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. This corruption must put on incorruption, the body of Christ, the church, has a heavenly destiny. In order for us to dwell in the heavenlies are corruptible, decaying due to sin, bodies must be changed to incorruptible ones, immortal ones. Christ has accomplished that for us, and we will receive that new body one day either upon death or at the rapture of the body of Christ. We will no longer be mortal beings, but we will put on immortality, eternal life, which we already possess as a member of the body of Christ. Then we will experience that when our bodies go through that necessary change for us to become immortal. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 56 to 57 The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The sting of death is sin, the law gives sin its strength to hold the sinner in death, but God has given us the victory through the resurrection of Christ approximately 2,000 years ago. The strength of sin is the law, the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18 verses 4 and 20 Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Romans 6 verse 23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death had no hold on Jesus Christ because he had no sin. It will not hold us in the grace either who have trusted in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Because of what Paul has told us about what God has done for us, we ought to be steadfast in the truth, and believing it as well as doing it, abounding in the work of the Lord. Our labor for Christ will not be in vain. 
Chapter 16 The Collection 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 to 2 Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. The collection for the saints, notice the apostolic authority Paul held as the apostle of the Gentiles. He gave orders to the Gentile churches of Galatia and Corinth to support the suffering Jewish church back in Jerusalem. As I had given order to the churches, Paul had his authority given to him by God when he placed him in the office as the apostle to the Gentiles. That office had as its main responsibility the care of all the churches. This was an offering that the Gentiles were commanded to give because they had all been partakers of Israel's spiritual blessings, so they were to in turn minister to them in carnal things. Upon the first day of the week, Sunday, this was a special offering that was to be taken by the Apostle Paul to the needy saints back in Jerusalem who were suffering great persecution as well as financial hardships because of the great dearth that was in the land at that time. Paul wanted the money stored up each week when worshippers came to services so that he wouldn't have to spend unnecessary time gathering the offering once he arrived and he could expedite it to those in need easier. As God hath prospered him, notice Paul didn't demand this church and those of Galatian to give him a tithe. We in the body of Christ were never commanded to tithe. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 3 to 4 And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. If it be meet that I go also, Paul wasn't sure if God would allow him to go up to Jerusalem with those that had given to the Jewish church, because whenever he showed up in Jerusalem there was always trouble there because of his seal for his countrymen. There was also trouble there because God wanted Paul reaching the Gentiles around the world and not focusing on his friends and associates back in Jerusalem. Paul gladly went where he did not want to go in the flesh. He would have rather stayed in Jerusalem trying to win his countrymen, but that was not to be, and Paul had no problem with that. How about you? 1 Corinthians 16 verses 5 to 9 Now I will come unto you, when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Paul was called to Macedonia in a vision in Acts chapter 16 and he wanted to make full proof of his ministry there, but he needed to have the support of the churches. Paul as you will see gave many orders to the churches and expected them to do as he said as he was the apostle of the Gentiles. Today, we do not have any apostolic succession handed down to us from Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, to his successor, and on and on to some modern-day apostle. Romans 11 verse 13 The office, however, lives on through the writings of the apostle of the Gentiles until that last day of this age of grace is completed at the rapture of the church. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Pentecost is the fourth of seven feasts of the Jews. The two most momentous days on which this feast occurred were when Moses received the law on Mount Sinai, 3,000 died on this day, and 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, 3,000 were saved on this day. Acts 2 verse 1 And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Acts 20 verse 16 For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus, because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 12 Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, Colossians 4 verse 3 Withal praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. There are many adversaries, 2 Timothy 3 verses 11 to 13 persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, 
but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 10 to 11 Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. See that he may be with you without fear, they were to take care of him physically and financially. Let no man therefore despise him. Timotheus was a young man and for that reason he had not been given the respect he should have received by many. This made Timotheus fearful of leading them and so Paul had to remind them of his calling and position as a servant of God. 1 Timothy 4 verse 12 Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 12 As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. Paul was not told by God to send Apollos to Corinth, and neither was Apollos instructed by God or an angel to go to Corinth at that particular time. He did agree that he should go there eventually when what he was currently doing for the Lord was over. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 13 to 14 Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. Quit you like men, it means to be like men who stand fast in the faith and are strong. Paul offers a few parting words of encouragement to further direct the saints there in Corinth before his soon arrival. We ought to be encouragers as well. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 15 I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanas, that it is the firstfruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. The firstfruits of Achaia, Stephanas or Stephen was the firstfruits of that region, he was the first person saved in the region of Achaia under Paul's preaching. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 16 to 18 That ye submit yourselves unto such, and to every one that helpeth with us, and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanas and Fortunatus and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. Submit yourselves unto such, and to every one that helpeth with us, Paul reminds this church to be submissive to those that God has placed over them in the ministry. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 19 to 21 The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord, with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with an holy kiss. The salutation of me Paul with mine own hand. Aquila and Priscilla, Paul's helpers who he met in Corinth. Acts 18 verses 2 and 18, 26 and Romans 16 verse 3. The salutation of me Paul with mine own hand, Paul had people write the majority of his epistles as the Lord dispensed them to him as mentioned in the following verses, but he always added his personal touch to the letters by writing a salutation to them. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 22 to 24 If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. The first epistle to the Corinthians was written from Philippi by Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus and Timotheus. Let him be anathema maranatha. If someone doesn't want to love the Lord after hearing the good news of his love towards mankind, then let them be cursed. The word anathema means to be accursed or damned. This is the only time that this word is not translated. Romans 9 verse 3 For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. The first epistle to the Corinthians was written from Philippi by Stephanus, and Fortunatus and Nicaeus and Timotheus. The End <laughs>